All right. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> so today we're going to be finishing up our last lecture on um, linear classification. <clears throat> and the last thing we have to talk about is the many different ways you can measure performance in classification. So we're going to first start out by just talking about the simpler binary case. <clears throat> so when you think about binary classification, there's actually two different ways you can make an error. Um, one way is that you, the, the truth is negative and you guess positive, and then the other way is that the truth is positive but you guess negative. <clears throat> so we can kind of visualize all the different options in this table, sometimes called a contingent, contingency table or a confusion matrix. And here you can see we have the truth down the rows and the prediction across the columns. And here we have the two different ways to make a correct decision. And then on the off diagonals, we have the two different ways to make an incorrect decision and error. And if you think about it, in some applications, <coughs> the, uh, the implications of these two different errors can be very different. So if you consider cancer diagnosis as just one application, <coughs> if, a, if a doctor tells you that you have cancer but you don't actually have cancer, it's unfortunate, you get worried, you have a few more tests done, but then you find out eventually you don't have it and it's okay. On the other hand, if you do have it, but the doctor tells you you don't, and you go on living your life and the cancer grows and grows, by the time you get the correct diagnosis, it may be too late. So that could be catastrophic. So those two different you know, errors um, can have very different um, implications in the application. So that's why sometimes you want to treat them differently. And that's where we can talk about different metrics to measure performance in classification. So the one that we have been focusing on is accuracy. In this case, you want to maximize the probability that you make a correct decision. And this is making a correct decision. If you think about the four possibilities, you're just maximizing the probability that of the four, you are, you are you know, getting those two. So in this case, for accuracy, you are um, rewarding equally the two different ways to make a correct decision, or you could say you're penalizing equally the two different ways to make an incorrect decision. And that might not be the right thing in your application. So, but if we want to interpret this, we could say in words, accuracy measures how often the test is correct. Okay, now <clears throat> there's another metric called precision, which says given that you predicted one, how often is the truth one? In the context of uh, cancer diagnosis, you could say, given a positive test, how often is the patient cancer? And then another option is recall, where you swap the ordering. So given that the truth is one, what's the probability that your prediction is one? <coughs> or in words, given that the patient has cancer, how often is it detected? So those are two kind of almost opposite things, right? Now, as you'll see, when you reward one of those, the other tends to get worse. So probably what you should be doing is coming up with a metric that weights both of them. And the, the one that's most commonly used for that is called the F1 score. And it's the harmonic mean of precision and recall. So you can see you have like the inverse precision the inverse recall, you average those, and then you uh, take the inverse of that. So what this is trying to do is, if you want to get a high F1 score, then you want to make sure that neither the precision nor the recall are too small. Because if one of those starts to get small, your F1 score will decrease. So it's, it's kind of a way to say both of them are important and I want both of them to be high. 
Okay, so those are common in machine learning. Now, <clears throat> sometimes in medical literature, they use slightly different names. So they use sensitivity. This is exactly the same thing as recall. Or in words, uh, given a sick patient, how often does the test agree? And um, specificity, you could say given a healthy patient, how often does the test agree with the truth? <clears throat> so we have all these different ways to measure, um, to measure, uh, you know, I was gonna say accuracy, but it's, accuracy is just one of the ways, all the different ways to measure um, how good our binary classifier is working. Any questions on any of these? Okay. So <clears throat> in scikit-learn, it's pretty easy to evaluate these. So we can use the cross-validate function. And in this function, you give it your estimator. So in this case, it's a logistic regression. You give it your uh, data, so your features and your labels. You tell it what kind of cross-validation you want to perform. So here we've made this cross-validation object up here. And you can see this is a k-fold cross-validation with 10 splits. And we're shuffling the data. And we're freezing the random state just because that way when we run this demo, we get the same answers. Otherwise, this would be random, and every time we run it, it would be a little different, and then the demo would no longer correspond to the lecture slide, so that's why I, I froze the seed there. So anyway, once you do the CV results, it's, um, it's pretty easy. You, you can extract the different test metrics. Oh, yeah, so the, the last thing I forgot to say is you give it, you can give it multiple scores. And the scores that we're giving it in this case are precision, recall, F1, and accuracy. And it will evaluate all those using cross-validation. So then we can extract the individual uh, scores. These are gonna be vectors. We can take the mean of them to find the average values. We can also compute the standard errors. And we can print them out. And this is what we get on the breast cancer demo with logistic regression. You can see that all these scores are in the 90s. And here the standard errors are around 1%. OK, so that's it's pretty, pretty, stand, uh, it's pretty straightforward to, to evaluate in scikit-learn. OK, so um, the next concept is that up till now, we've been focusing on hard decisions, like y hat is either 1 or minus 1. But actually, there's different ways to make that hard decision. So when we started this, we can say just threshold z. Z, remember, is the, um, z is the linear score that we get out of linear classification method. And we previously said just whenever z is positive, set y hat to 1 whenever z is negative set y hat to minus one or zero or whatever the non-one label is. But actually, um, there is some freedom there. We can use a different threshold than zero to make that sign change. So in fact, one way we can think about z, what it means, is it's a way to give us a confidence that's a, a probability, right? Because when we do logistic regression, we're saying that we have a model that the probability of that y equals 1 given z takes on this logistic function. So this, now that we have a probability, we can, um, we can use it a bit more flexibil flexibly. So we can say, maybe I only want to set y equals 1 when that probability exceeds some threshold t. And that threshold may not be 1 half. It may be larger or smaller. So here's an example on the right of precision in blue, recall in orange, versus that threshold. So as that threshold gets higher and higher, your precision score increases, but your recall decreases. So if you um, want to, let's say, equalize precision and recall, then you want to set your threshold 
a little bit less than one half for this for this data set. So you have that flexibility. Okay, so this is the main idea. We can play with this threshold. So the reason why we focused on t equals one half originally is that when t equals one half, you can prove that that minimizes the error rate or maximizes accuracy. So if accuracy is what you care about, you want to set your threshold at one half. But as we said, sometimes accuracy is not what you care about. Sometimes you might care much more about making um, a false alarm than, than you do uh, a missed detection. So you can change that threshold T as you like. So as we saw here, different values of T, they trade precision for recall. But you can also see in the bottom plot, you can trade sensitivity for specificity. So here we have specificity in blue, sensitivity in, or in orange. So as the threshold changes, so does that trade-off. And we can adjust that according to the application. Okay. Um, any questions on thresholding idea? All right. So um, one of the, okay, so, so here's, Here's another way that we can see a trade-off down here. You can see that as I vary the threshold, the true positive rate, we can define that as follows. This is the true positive rate, given that the truth is one, how often do you predict one? And here's the false positive rate, given that the truth is zero, how often do you predict one? So the top is an error, something you want to minimize. The bottom is you know, one of the ways of making a correct decision. And on the bottom right, we see how those things vary with the threshold. They're both decreasing, um, but generally speaking, we want to be in this region where your false positive rate is small and your true positive rate is large. But exactly where you want to be in that region depends on the application and you can change the threshold accordingly. So <clears throat> sometimes, um, you're not really sure what threshold you will eventually use. So you're designing a test and you want to make a test that has good performance for a wide range of thresholds. So the way that you can do that is you can use this thing, this metric called area under the curve. So this curve we're talking about, this is the receiver operating characteristic curve. That's this thing. And this as you can see, is showing true positive rate versus false positive rate. And the way that you move along the curve is varying the threshold. So um, in particular, you can see down here that a high value of threshold leads to a small value of, I guess, of both metrics. So as you move this way, as the threshold moves this way, um, your point along this curve moves. Right. High threshold, you get some point here where you have um, somewhere like there. Okay, so as we were saying, since I don't know exactly where I want to be along this threshold, I want to design a test um, you know, cross-validate and all that, so that it's good for a range of thresholds, what I can do is I can maximize the area under the curve, which is this area. And you can see that's going to that's gonna, um, encourage good behavior for a range of thresholds. So this is something that's, um, your area under the curve is, is one of the things that you can compute in um, SK learn pretty easily using this metrics uh, library, and, um, and you know it's it's a nice performance metric, which is threshold independent. That's why people like to use it. <clears throat> 
Any questions on this? All right. All right, <clears throat> multi-class classification. So now things are a bit more complicated here. So there's going to be many possible error types. You can visualize what happens in this table. So here we have the truth going down the rows, prediction going across the columns. And here we're just counting up the number of times that we saw these different outcomes in our experiment. So writing the table this way with these raw counts is not always the most convenient option. So a little bit more convenient is to normalize the rows so that they sum to one. After you do that, then you can interpret the table a lot more easily. So um, in general, if you look at the kth row and lth column, that will then tell you um, an empirical estimate of the probability that your prediction is L given that the truth is K. And what that means is if you look at the diagonal terms after normalization, you find the per class accuracy. So given that Y is in K, what's the probability that you've predicted K? And when you look at the off diagonal terms, they show you all the different ways that you can make errors, or you have made errors. So um, you can assemble all those different, um, so here's like, these are the diagonal terms we talked about. Probability that you predicted correctly given that it was in class K. Um, <coughs> If you take those and you weight those by the probability that the, the label is in class K, then this becomes the joint probability of Y hat and Y, both being K. And then finally, if you sum over the, um, yeah, you sum over all the Ks, you get finally the, the overall accuracy. So it's just a way of taking this and and converting it to overall accuracy. <clears throat> so, um, is all that making sense? Okay, so the last thing I want to point out is when we have a data set with imbalanced labels, what that means is that the probability uh, that the data is coming from one class is much less than. Um, so if we have a total of capital K classes, and if the data was uniformly distributed across classes, the probability that it's in any one class is one over capital K, right? But sometimes we have data sets where the probability that it's actually in one of the classes is much less than one over uh, capital K. And in that case, we would say that the labels are imbalanced. So <clears throat> let me give you an example of this. So let's say I just have binary classification, two classes. Let's say I have 100 samples. It turns out that 99 of my samples are in class one, and I only have one sample in class zero. Okay, extremely imbalanced. So in this case, I could make a classifier that just no matter what, it always predicts one. What would the accuracy be then if I have 99 ones, one not one, and my classifier always predicts one? 99%, 99 accuracy, right? So. Is that good? <laughs> it's a trivial classifier, right? It doesn't do anything. It always just says, it always predicts one. So no, it's, it's good in terms of accuracy, but you can see when you have an imbalanced data set, accuracy is no longer a valid metric. What you really care about there would be um, maybe things like this. Given that the truth is zero, what's the probability that I'm gonna guess zero? So for that trivial predictor I just mentioned, since I'm never guessing zero, this, this probability, this conditional probability would be zero, okay? So that's where you start to see why this classifier is not good. So, um, and, and that's where you, when you get to things like um, F1 score, <clears throat> where you care about, well, okay, so, so here, um, I guess even precision and recall because they both focus on what happens when y or y hat is one, 
maybe you wouldn't even see uh, the problem in that case. But certainly you would see it with some of these other metrics. Okay, so <clears throat> when we have these imbalanced labels, we just have to be really careful uh, how we approach our problem. So there's various different things people have suggested to overcome this label imbalance problem. So as we've been talking about, one approach is to use a different metric than accuracy. Just use some other metrics that are more fair across the different classes. Another option that's simple, works pretty well, is you resample your data. So what we mean by that is, in this example I said where I have 99 ones and one zero, I would just copy that zero sample 98 times so that I have 99 of each. And then I would approach this problem to just minimize or maximize accuracy. So that's very easy to do. Just you know, artificially copy your samples until they're balanced. And then, uh, then, then just take an actually maximizing approach. That usually works pretty well. Um, there's also uh, different approaches where you, where you modify the classifier. Um, and if you want to know more about this, I have put a few links here, um, three different articles which describe in more detail different ways to do this. So this could be very important for you if you run into one of these problems. Okay, so, um, so that's all I had to present for the metrics and for this chapter as a whole, but since we have a, some time left over, I would be happy to talk about, to go back and talk about any of the things we saw earlier, logistic regression, multinomial logistic regression. Are there any concepts which are kind of fuzzy that people would like to see again? We had two Zoom lectures and I can't see your faces in the Zoom lectures, so I don't know whether you're understanding it or not. Um, so does anybody want to talk about, to review any of these, these other things, or, or do you prefer to move on to the next unit? No thoughts? Anything? No? Uh, can you talk about the maximum likelihood? Yeah, sure. So let's see. Maximum likelihood, I guess we, we saw it in the last unit, and we saw it again here. But let's talk about it in this context. <clears throat> so in maximum likelihood, we have some probabilistic model of our data. And it always, in supervised classification, it takes this form. We say the probability of the targets or the labels, given the features, and given the parameters of our model. So this is something that we just have to declare. This is, we have many options. Um, some of them are much easier to deal with than others, computationally and so on. But we have to choose this based on a little bit about what we know about the application, what we have um, available to us. And so in this, in this unit, we, or in the last unit, we saw one way to think about the likelihood was from an additive Gaussian noise model. So in this case, this is again unit four. We said that we had like y equals a beta plus epsilon, so y, these are all vectors, and epsilon was multivariate Gaussian noise with mean zero and a variance, uh, yeah, we called it sigma e, sigma epsilon squared times identity. So because we're thinking about this as a random variable, this guy, you know, is Gaussian with mean zero, here I'm fixing all these parameters in this probability. So I can treat A as deterministic, I can think of beta as deterministic when I condition on them. And so then, what's the distribution of all this stuff if the distribution of epsilon is this? So this comes up in one of your homework problems this week. 
So this, this has zero mean. What's the mean of this? A, yeah, A beta, exactly. Because we're thinking about all that as fixed, so when I condition on it, this just becomes a deterministic thing that offsets the mean of this. And so the distribution is still going to be Gaussian. It's still going to have the same covariance. All the changes is now the mean is no longer zero. The mean of y, you know, given a and beta, the mean is a beta. So that's where we got this expression. This likelihood, the probability of y, given the data, given the parameters, is going to be Gaussian. This is the variable here. And then the rest is the mean and the covariance. Okay, so this is, this is how we got the likelihood in the last unit. In this unit, we got the likelihood um, different way. We first looked at what happens at the scalar level. So we said for every one of our um, <coughs> labels, you know, let's say yi, we have this model given zi, and we're just declaring this form. We're doing this because it turns out that it's relatively simple. It's a relative, even though it looks a little bit complicated, it's actually relatively simple compared to many other options that you might try to think of. And that's the first part. So this is your label given your score. And then the score is just a linear function of your parameters and your features. So this is the model that we have assumed in this unit. And we can put that, um, all right, so, so here is, here's the model for the ith label. And then when we look at the model for all the labels together, this is by the independence assumption, the product of the, the probabilities of all the individual labels. <clears throat> okay, so, so once, once we know what this is, you know, you know we, we have this, we plug it in, we do some simplifications and all that. But once we know what it is, the maximum likelihood procedure, no matter what the likelihood is, it says just maximize that for fixed data, maximize it over your parameters. <coughs> and uh, in doing this, in some cases, it's very um, computationally simple, like in this Gaussian case, when you look at, okay, the, the Gaussian itself is complicated because you have a an e raised to a power with a quadratic. But once you take the negative log of it, it becomes much simpler. This negative log of this is just a quadratic term in beta plus a constant term in beta. And since what we're doing here is we're trying to maximize over the parameters beta, we don't have to worry about the details of that constant. We just maximize, or in this case, minimize this quadratic. Minimizing the quadratic is something we learned about in Units one and two, we derived it, and it, it gave us um, this nice closed form expression. <clears throat> so we want to take the same approach in this unit, but the, the form of the likelihood has changed. So we did this derivation. This was, again, our scalar model for what happens for all the different samples i. Uh, I can talk more about this derivation in a moment, but at the end we got finally some, <coughs> some expression. And so now we have this optimization problem that we have to solve. Solving this will be the subject of the next unit, unit six. But for now we know that we can just call the scikit-learn function and it does this for us. Internally it solves this optimization problem and it returns for us the optimal parameters. So in principle, it can be done. <clears throat> okay, so that's kind of the big picture on what maximum likelihood is, and you know, yeah, you know, what it is, and generally speaking, how you formulate those problems. Now, <clears throat> sometimes for some particular uh, versions of the likelihood, you have to you know, be careful in terms of the derivation. So here, the challenge that we saw is that we start with this joint probability, or conditional probability. We write it as a product of these marginal or individual probabilities. 
we then take the log, the negative log of both sides, which if I take the log of a product, I get the sum of the logs. <coughs> and, uh, and we're thinking that's going to be that log is useful because of these, these E's. But here we run into something sort of tricky. We would like to know what is the, the, the PDF, or I guess this is a PMF, because Y is discrete, discrete random variable. So it's a probability mass function. We, we would like to know what is the expression for this when Y is 1 and when Y is minus 1. Those are the only two possibilities for YI that we have. But the, what's, what's complicating is that we actually have two different expressions depending on whether it's 1 or minus 1. So we have to figure out some way to take both of these expressions and put it in here. The way that we do that is using this, this trick with the switching variables. We put these switching variables here where for one of the yi's, the first is 1 and the second is 0. In other words, the first is on, the second is off. And what that will do is that will expose this term and cancel this. But when you look at the other value of y, when y is minus 1, then this goes to 0 and this goes to 1, which kills this term and exposes this one. So this is our way with these switching variables. This is our way of writing both forms of this in one expression. Is that making sense? OK. And we use this particular switching variable just because y is 1 or minus 1. We also saw later that there's sometimes we would like to write the expression for when y is 1 or 0. In that case, the switching variable is easier. You would just have yi, because that's 1 or 0, and you'd have 1 minus yi, because that's going to be 0 or 1. And then so the derivation is, is the same as this. It's just that the switching variables are slightly different. And at the end of the day, you just get yi here. So that's the only difference. Okay, so once we, once we have this switching variable trick done, the rest is pretty straightforward. It's just we have to take the log of, of this, and so that's going to be the log of the numerator minus the log of the denominator, but the log of the numerator, that's log of e to z, so that's just z, and the log of the denominator, well, we can't really simplify that, so that's just there. And we have to do the same thing here. So log of the denominator, log of the numerator is zero. Log of the denominator is again this expression. We can't really simplify it. And finally, we just collect the terms and simplify all that stuff, and we get this last expression. So this is as simple as we can make it. Um, and this is just something that we need to uh, work with in our optimization procedure. So does that answer the question on likelihood, or is there something else? OK. Uh, let's see. What else? Anything else you'd like to talk about in this unit? Maybe let's just take a quick look. Let's take a quick look at the multinomial, the multi-class version. So. Um, So the, I guess the first idea is, <coughs> let's go back here. The first idea is, if I have a bunch of binary classifiers, how do I make them into multi-class or non-binary classifier? And the idea is this one versus rest. So you make a set of different binary classifiers that predict you're either in class K or not in class K. So for example, here's classes 1, 2, and 3. So I first make one classifier that says you're either in 1 or not in 1. And you can see that this would be the boundary. And I make another classifier that says you're either in 2 or not in 2. That gives this boundary. And finally, classifier that says you're either in class 3 or not in class 3, which makes this binary boundary. So now. The next step is how do I combine those three classifiers together? And the idea is 
when I evaluate each of these classifiers on a new data point, I'm going to get a score. So that score Z is one way you can think about it. So as we'll see a little bit later, Z measures the, different, the distance from the boundary. So we know that when you're on the boundary, Z is zero, right? When you're towards the positive class, Z goes positive. And when you're away from the positive class, Z goes negative. So if I'm at this point here, I know for that classifier, I'm going to get a negative Z. It's going to, be, it's going to take on some value. So I evaluate it for that, that classifier. Now I look at this classifier. Same point, I evaluate the Z for that one. It's going to be slightly negative. And I evaluate the Z for this one. Again, it's going to be negative. Now I have three confidence values. I can think of these numbers Z as real numbers somewhere between minus infinity and infinity, or as we talked about um, several times, let's go back to the equation. I can think about them as uh, Z, you know, a real number score, or I can put Z inside this equation and it maps the real line to the interval between 0 and 1. As a result, I can interpret Z as a probability. I guess it's no longer Z that's, that I'm interpreting. I'm interpreting this logistic function of Z. So now I can map that to a probability that's somewhere between 0 and 1. So <clears throat> in either case, whether I look at Z or whether I look at its probability, what I would do next to do multi-class classification is I would say, OK, for this point, I've now gotten three scores, a Z from there, a Z from here, and a Z from here. Which of those is the most likely? Which is the largest Z? If, if the large, you know, based on this, I think for this point, we're closest to this boundary. So that would probably be the largest Z. I would say I'm in class one. So that's how I've taken those three binary classifiers and made a single multi, or k equals 3 classifier from them. Does that idea make sense? <clears throat> so, um, yeah, mathematically, this is what it looks like. We have a zk for every k, for every little k going from 1 to capital K. So for every class, we have a score. For every class, we have an intercept term and a weight vector. And so we make a prediction, a score for every class. If you want to map this to a probability through the likelihood, you can. Whether you look for the largest score or the largest probability, it's the same. And that will tell you which, if you want to make a hard decision, this tells you which of the classes you're in out of the K. <clears throat> so that's how we can put binary classifiers together to get a non-binary classifier. Okay, any questions on that concept? Okay, the next concept is how do you train the weights and the, the intercept term? So we tried a naive approach at the beginning. We said, let's use least squares linear regression. So here we have an example where our data points are these guys. And we know from units one and two how to do this. So we look for the line, the regression line that minimizes the sum of squared errors. And that is going to give us this orange line. And now, that's, that's our z. This is, this is x this way. And, um, and, and this line is z as a function of x. And the, the last step would be look at the sign of z. So whenever, here's the 0. So whenever z is positive, y hat is 1. Whenever z is negative, y hat is minus 1. So if we do this, if we use least squares linear regression to train our weights and intercept term, we have a problem. We're, you can see we're not putting the, the boundary, the classification boundary, at the right spot. We're actually going to make an error on our training data. Um, and the reason why is that you can see that least squares regression is getting really distracted by this outlier. It has moved, so the further I move this to the right, the, the more and more the regression line will tilt down. 
and it's, it's really paying attention. It's trying to fit this. But if you think about it, it's, this is actually the easiest point to classify out of all of them, right? The ones that are kind of near each other, this is where it's difficult was when you're here. If I have, you know, maybe this is tumor size and this is likelihood of having cancer. If I see a giant tumor, then I know that this person has cancer. Right? It's obvious, but somehow this regressor is getting confused. So what logistic regression does is it, it uses a different way of fitting the coefficients. Rather than assuming that there's Gaussian noise on these data samples and using that as its probabilistic model, it uses the logistic model, which is illustrated here in this red line. So this is the probability that y equals 1 given x after we fit the, the logistic model. So according to this data set, you can see if you got a sample right here, which is between your training points, then it really just doesn't know whether it should classify that as 1 or minus 1. But as you go to the right, um, now you have a probability that's greater than 1 half. If you go to the left, you have a probability that's less than 1 half, and you can use that to classify these. This point out here is the most obvious, and then it has the highest probability. So the logistic likelihood is actually going to um, kind of care about this point the least because it's the most obvious. So it's going to focus much more on what happens here, where, um, where the, you know, near, near the boundary. And um, as a result, when it fits its linear regression line, it's, it's not getting distracted by this point. So this one is going through the origin. It's putting the boundary here exactly where we would like it, unlike least squares. So the difference here is not the regression model. Both models are doing linear regression. In fact, that's why it's called logistic regression, because they're both doing linear regression. The only thing that's changing is the loss. This is least squares linear regression, and this is logistic linear regression. So the logistic loss is what's different. There's a question over Zoom on Monday that said, you know, we saw an example on homework one where we could, it was a nonlinear model, but we could linearize it with some operations. And the question is, why can't we just do that here? Well, this model that we're using is already linear. So we don't need to linearize it. The part that's nonlinear is the loss. But that's always nonlinear. Even in linear regression, we had a quadratic loss. So what has changed are the details of the loss function. And because the details have changed, the, um, the maximum likelihood problem has changed, the, the solution. The likelihood has changed. The solution of the ML problem has changed. And now it's just unfortunately not a problem that we can write the answer down in closed form with something we have to attack numerically. And this is actually true, as we'll see, of almost all the machine learning models. They're all too complicated to write down in closed form, except for linear regression. So this is, this is going to be the norm. And that's why we have to get better at you know, optimization. And that's why the subject of the next unit is how to attack problems like this, because that, that's going to be an important theme going forward. <clears throat> okay, so let's see. So I think we're, we're covering some of the more important points um, from the Zoom lectures here. Oh, yeah, and then one other thing, let me point out. When we, when we train our multi, our multi um, logistic regression model, we actually have two different options. One option is to train each one of our binary models separately from each other. So like you would, you would first say class one versus the rest. So you take your data, you sort of reshape it into class one and then put everything else in one big class and you train your binary logistic regression model for that. And then you fix those coefficients and you don't touch them. Then you move to class two versus all the rest. You train those weights, you fix them, you don't touch them. Then you go to class three and so on. So now you have individually trained K different binary models. 
So there's another approach where you try to do better than that. You try to say, well, maybe I should come up with a different formulation that looks at all of them together instead of separately. And this formulation is, is known as the is multinomial logistic regression, or it uses a slightly different version of, of the loss that has here. It's, it's the exponential that we saw before, but instead of just like a one plus e to the z, it has a sum of all the other, these, this is e to the z for all the other classes, and then this is the one class at the top that we're, we're looking at. So with this slightly more complicated um, probabilistic model, the softmax, we, um, we had to redo the derivation of the, of the likelihood. So it looks a little different. The concept is very similar. We have switching variables. The switching variables are best understood through one-hot coding, but now we're one-hot coding the labels, not the features. And at the end of the day, we get this likelihood function here. And so here, um, you can see that all the different Zs are tied together. We can't just separate them. And so when we do this optimization, we have to jointly optimize over all the different intercepts and all the different weights. This ends up being the workhorse model for deep networks that do classification. They end up all using this as the, as the, um, as the training loss. So that's, that's probably where this is most famously known from, is not so much from linear classification, but actually from deep networks where you use this uh, at the very last layer. You can say that the last layer of a deep network is just gonna be doing multinomial logistic regression, and all the early layers are just doing some nonlinear feature transformations so that the features seen by the last layer are really nice and approximately linearly separable. So that's why this is super important. Um, we're seeing it now, but we're gonna see it a lot later. <clears throat> okay, so, so those are the two options. And when we, when we go to the code, we can select between those two options. So we can use the same logistic regression function, whether it's binary or whether we have more than two classes. And this is how we select. If it's OVR, that's one versus rest, or multinomial. This is the true joint design. Multinomial, you'll see it takes longer to do the optimization, uh, but it tends to give you a better result, better accuracy at the end. We can also change the penalty if we want to use, um, if we want to use no penalty, then I suggest selecting L2 here and making the inverse regularization strength large. Like in this case, it's 1E5, so this will give you, this will act almost like there's no penalty at all. If you want to do feature selection, then you choose a penalty of L1, and that will set certain weights to zero, which could be really important in some cases. But then you really have to be careful about how you choose this, this uh, inverse strength here. You, if you choose it very large, essentially the penalty is ignored and it will you know, not do any feature selection. If you choose it really small, then it will turn all your coefficients off and will be doing terrible. And you have to find an in-between value so that it sets a subset to zero and you want it to be just the right subset, right? For feature selection, we want to find the be very best subset. So what we do is we, we try many different values of C on a grid, and we'll see which one works best. It's a little bit more complicated than that because just as we saw with lasso in the last unit, when you use the L1 penalty, what happens is the weights returned by this model get shrunk towards the origin. The larger the, or the, yeah, the larger the penalty gets or the smaller C gets, the more coefficients get turned off, but the, the ones that remain on have gotten squashed towards zero. And so now their very small values may no longer be optimal for classification. So what we would like to do then is we use this to figure out which subset 
of weights or which subset of features to use. Once we know the subset, we use that subset with logistic regression with essentially no penalty, something like L2 and a very large C. And then that will enjoy the benefits of feature selection, but it's computing its coefficients <coughs> without the bias imposed by the regularization term. And that's when you'll finally see the best performance. So, um, so the demos show a couple different ways of, of doing that. One way is with the for loop. Uh, another way, which I just added recently, is using what's called a pipeline in scikit-learn, where you can, you can put together several different estimators in a cascade and, and refer to them as a single estimator. So in this case, the three things we would cascade are logistic regression with L1, then a feature selection step, which would threshold any weights greater than zero it keeps. It throws away the weights that are zero. And then the third one is logistic regression without a penalty. So you put those three things together in one pipeline or one estimator, and then you can just call grid search CV with that. And it's pretty straightforward. So that's in the demo, and you'll get a chance to use that in, in lab five. So um, I think those are the, the main points. Are there any questions on anything else? Okay, so classification is gonna be, we're gonna focus on classification for, uh, I would say, almost all the rest of the course, and probably your final project will, will be, be on classification. So all this stuff we've been talking about recently.